All right, hello everybody. Um, it's a beautiful evening to talk about the fishery. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so as Dan mentioned, I'm with the Great Lakes Mass Marketing Program, which is a multi-agency effort coordinated by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and I am happy to be here today to share some of the results we have. So uh, a very quick outline for you today. Uh, for those who perhaps are unfamiliar with the program, I will briefly go over a review and then focus on results uh, from the study on Chinook salmon as well as lake trout. And then I'll close today with some results from a salmon and trout diet study in Lake Michigan that's been ongoing since 2014. So, um, so a mass marketing program. So uh, Great Lakes states and tribal uh, agencies as well as the Fish and Wildlife Service stock millions of salmon and trout in the Great Lakes every year. And uh, that fishery is worth about $7 billion with a B annually in the local economies. The uh, mass marketing program was founded to help provide better information and uh, foster enhanced understanding of the fishery and to assist with, uh, with management of the fishery. So it's a collaboration amongst the federal, state, and tribal agencies, again, coordinated by Fish and Wildlife Service. It's established to help address questions for the uh, management objectives for salmon and trout. And uh, the program, we provide uh, tagging, marking, field data collection, and analytical support ser uh, services. And uh, none of this would actually happen, though, without the participation of stakeholders and anglers like you. Our, our field teams get out there, um, interact with, uh, with anglers every summer, and thanks to your support, we have six years worth of data with over 118,000 fish <laughs> from open water anglers in, in this data set. That gives us a very powerful basis for addressing some of these, uh, these questions with regards to survival, uh, movement, uh, wild reproduction, and contributions to fisheries. So the, uh, the tagging and marking operation, this began for lake trout in 2010, Chinook salmon in 2011, and we started steelhead this past year. Um, happens at the state's clever hatcheries using these, these automatic uh, fish tagging trailers. We tag about 10 million fish each year, and uh, the tags provide critical information on the stocking location, uh, the age and the year class, and the genetic strain of these fish. The, the fin clip allows us to distinguish between fish that are of hatchery origin and fish that are wild produced. Uh, in order to uh, do this study, we also get out there, we collect fish, uh, tags from fish that are harvested by anglers, uh, as well as other sources. Uh, basically, these are the adults returning to the fishery. Uh, our six field teams are located where these red stars are on this map, and they, they sample over 40 ports a year. Those are these, these blue dots here on the, the map as well. Um, handling, in a, in a full season, uh, over 20,000 fish a year in Lake Michigan and a little over a thousand in Lake Huron. And these are just salmon and trout species. So um, a fairly large sample size. The field survey costs about 250,000 a year in salary for the staff. And what we get in return for that is about 450 sampling days, cumulative sampling days per year um, from April through September to, to provide these data. And then they actually get at these tags back in the lab. They're taken out by hand. Each one of these tags is uh, you know, only a fraction of an inch long. Um, and throughout the program, we've been able to recover a little over 86,000 coated wire tags from 91,000 snouts. That's about a 5% uh, tag loss rate, which is what we see in the hatcheries, and this is what we would expect. So um, because we're out there in the field and handling all these fish, we have several studies we've been able to assist with. Uh, I already mentioned the salmon and trout diet studies. We've been collecting uh, muscle tissues for uh, isotope analysis, which provides an indication of diet. We've been doing that since 2014. We've been collecting stomachs since 2015. Uh, we've also helped with a Notre Dame-led study on mercury biocontamination, uh, studies looking at the origin of wild steelhead and Chinook salmon, Chinook salmon growth rates, lamprey wounding on the different species of salmon and trout, and effects of lamprey, trout on, uh, lamprey attack on host condition. So um, getting a lot of bang for our buck here with the mass marking program. The, the funding outlook for the program 2018 to 2019 um, you can see the most recent year at the top here, and we're looking at a projection of about $1.5 million in funding. Um, again, this is to help provide information on a $7 billion fishery, so that's a, uh, a small investment to make for the amount of, of, um, of data we, we have to provide. Um, I want to point out the funding source here is primarily the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, that's the GLRI. Um, that is a, uh, uh, it's, not a it's not a permanent <coughs> funding program, it's not a, not a base funded program. So um, one thing to also inform folks here about is that there actually has been a, a, an act a, uh, that's been introduced as a bill into the Senate by uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow here of Michigan with co-sponsors um, 
uh, Senator Peters of Michigan, Senator Sherrod of Ohio, and Senator Schumer of New York. So this, uh, this bill, if it were to make it through the Senate, would formally establish, uh, sorry, if it would make it through and be passed by the Senate and the House and, and signed, would formally establish this program under the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, specifying the collaboration that we have between the states, tribes, and federal agencies, uh, help make the data available to all agencies, which is something that's already ongoing, and would potentially authorize the program for up to $5 million annually. That would actually allow uh, the mass marking program to expand to other species and other lakes. Um, as I mentioned at present, we're, we're looking at lake trout, Chinook salmon, and steelhead stock from lakes here on in Michigan. So um, that's kind of a br brief overview of our program. And, uh, and with that, I, without further ado, I want to get into some of the results. So for Chinook salmon, we've been able to look at uh, uh, a lot of different things. I'm going to start with wild recruitment. This is something we uh, evaluate annually. The stocked fish uh, have the adipose fin clip, so that's a lack of a fin, uh, adipose fin here, whereas the wild fish have no fin clip and no footed wire tag. Uh, we actually looked at well over 100,000 fish with our quality control checks in the hatchery, and only one half of 1% of those stocked fish are released without a fin clip due to error. Um, we also looked at uh, close to 1,200 fish in the field, um, looking at uh, uh, fish that had no fin clip, examining for wire tags, and we didn't see very many at all. Um, so there's very little evidence of fin regeneration. And so what we conclude is that 99.5% of those unclipped Chinook salmon are in fact wild Chinook salmon. The, uh, so we look, we look at the percentage of Chinook salmon um, every year, and this, uh, this is the year class at age one, so you gotta subtract a year. So in 2017, we're looking at the 2016 year class, and we're age one in 2017. Um, the percent wild is uh, between 50 and 60% for much of the time series here. Um, and so that's really reemphasizing this point that at this point, the majority of the Chinook salmon fishery in Lake Michigan is comprised of wild fish. Now, uh, using this value and the number of fish stocked, we can, we can do a ratio to look at and estimate the actual number of Chinook salmon smolts in millions um, from each year class. And so in this figure, um, you have uh, the blue bars are the wild smolts that we estimate, and the orange bars are the stock smolts that we know from uh, hatchery release records. And so this most recent year class, 2016 year class, we saw kind of an uptick here, um, about 4.2 million wild smolts um, estimated to be entering the lake. And then you had the stock fish on top of that, and you're about 6.6 .6 million for the 2016 year class. Um, one key component to note from this figure is if you look just at these blue bars, this value of 4.2 million is right in line with the time series average. If you look at 2006 through 2009 and 2011, this blue bar is right where that, uh, right in line with those, those values. But we do see a fair bit of variability in year class strength. So there was two very strong year classes for 2010 and 2012, and two rather weak year classes recently in 2013 and 2015. And this kind of emphasizes the need to, to look at this on an annual basis. So to summarize what we've learned for, from wild recruitment, the majority of Chinook salmon in Lake Michigan and Huron are wild fish. Wild recruitment is variable and needs to be monitored annually. Another thing we're able to look at is the survival of Chinook salmon. This is a very complicated figure, but uh, it's one simple message. Basically, every bar you see here is the estimated survival corrected for number of fish stocked based on return rate for each individual tag lot of Chinook salmon stocked in the lake and it's organized by state. Basically, the taller the bar is, the higher the survival. And you can see that our, our highest survival rates tend to be from the Wisconsin shoreline. Uh, although there are certainly some good producers in every state, by and large, this, there's a larger volume here. So we, we look at this uh, kind of across year classes, and we can compile that into a, a map to kind of summarize this. Basically, these blue areas here have consistently high survival rates whereas um, the, the yellow areas are kind of more average. These purple districts were a little bit strange. Some year classes were really good in terms of their survival, and other year classes were really poor. And then uh, MM6 here and Green Bay, those red ones, those are consistently poor survival in terms of the number of returns we see per unit of fish stock. Um, but we don't know exactly why this is, but there are some potential factors that could factor into this. We have uh, temperature differences, typically colder temperatures on the western shore of the lake. Um, possible differences in food, although if you look at the maps that Chuck showed in the previous talk, that tends to be variable. Um, we do know that the western shore does have more rocky substrate, which could be important for invertebrates, which may or may not be a good food source for very young Chinook salmon as they smalled out. Um, 
Evidence suggests there's more wild recruits coming out of the streams here in Michigan. So maybe there's some competition that's reducing the survival of fish stocked here. And then uh, another potential factor is predation, and I highlight Green Bay as an example here because of that strong walleye fishery there. So again, just some factors that could be contributing to these patterns. So uh, again, to summarize here for survival, the fish stock on the western shore appear to be surviving the best, uh, with poor survival for fish stock on Green Bay and in MM6. Um, we've been able to look at movement rates for Chinook salmon based on their coated wire tags. We look at where they were stocked and compare that to where they were harvested. So one example of this, um, this is a map showing the locations of fish that were landed in Frankfurt, Michigan. So each one of these dots is proportional to the number of fish landed here in, Michi in, in Frankfurt, Michigan, a little bit north of here, or a lot of it north of here, I guess. Um, and you can see that those fish are coming from all over, all over Lake Michigan, some coming from Lake Huron. Um, the dot sizes are proportional to the number of recoveries. So uh, in line with what we see with the, that survival pattern, the, the largest dots here are from the Wisconsin shore, even though Frankfurt's closest to fish stocked in Traverse Bay and MM6. Um, so uh, this kind of emphasizes that movement uh, that we see. However, um, in the fall, we see what we'd expect to see with the Chinook salmon. They move back to where they were stocked. This is an example from the 2011 year class. Um, and what you're seeing here on this axis is the percentage of salmon captured in the same management unit or statistical district where they were stocked. Um, for age one, two, and three from April through um, September or October. And the bottom line here is that from April through July, less than 10% of the Chinook salmon are actually captured where, anywhere close to where they were stocked. Uh, August is a bit of a transitional month, and once, once again in September and October, you're looking at 70, 80, 90% of those fish being recovered in the same area where they were stocked. So the, the recap here is we see evidence of high Chinook salmon movement during summer, where the capture location is not likely to be the stocking location, but the fall fishery is determined by that stocking location. So um, recently we were able to take a look at gross rates of Chinook salmon. So this is a figure of just stocked fish. You see the total average length versus their age. And uh, the main takeaway here is the growth rates are really not differing all that much. These lines overlap a fair bit. Um, so not a huge difference by stocking region, but that small difference that we did see actually lines up with the differences in survival. So on the, on the right side of this, uh, this figure here, this is actually that same survival map I showed earlier with the different colors, except now it's a heat map where your higher survival are your, your darker red areas. And if you look at the estimates of growth, those same areas have higher estimates of growth where we see higher survival. So some of those same factors we discussed earlier could be contributing to this pattern. Uh, another pattern we observed is that there is a, appears to be a very tight coupling uh, between alewife density and Chinook salmon growth. So uh, this is the Chinook salmon mean length at age one, and that's this blue line right here. This orange line is the year and older alewife density in fish per hectare, as, as estimated by USGS from, from Warner at all. You can, you can see, it doesn't take a ton of analysis to see that these, these patterns are identical. Um, and the fact that they're so tightly correlated really is indicative of that limited food supply. If, uh, if food supply was not limited, you, you'd expect growth to be dictated by other things, like uh, um, the, the, the climate in any given season, um, or the, the abundance of, of Chinook. And, and what we actually see is a very tight coupling with the food supply. So, uh, to recap here, growth was similar among locations. That's consistent with what we see for movement of Chinook salmon throughout the lake. And the, the growth and survival patterns were similar. Um, I didn't have time to show the data, but we also have evidence that uh, pretty much every year class, the stocked fish have a, uh, they don't grow faster than wild fish. I, I should have rephrased that. They are larger than wild fish at a given age because they have a little bit of a leg, leg up in, in the hatchery and it appears that the wild fish never catch up. But the lines are actually parallel to one another. Um, so they don't grow faster, they just have a little bit of a leg up and they keep that leg up throughout their lives. So um, we also see annual variability in growth is linked to annual abundance in alewife, and this is something we wouldn't expect if alewife were not limited. So with that, I'm, I'm going to move on now to, to lake trout. Um, I've got a couple of quick things to show here. Um, we look at the similar to the salmon, we look at the um, uh, patterns in lake trout wild recruitment. We measure this by looking at the percentage of wild fish in each of our management units. Um, and as uh, someone mentioned earlier, we see kind of higher percentages here in the southern part of the lake than in the northern part of the lake, um, really high percentages in Lake Huron. And uh, one thing that's likely happening, uh, the gentleman earlier asked a question about why we don't see any small lake trout. Um, it, it looks like it, much of that wild reproduction is probably happening at some of these offshore reefs in the Mid Lake Complex or at Julian's Reef. 
Um, it's uh, from a different study, we see some evidence with stockfish that they appear to be coming into the near shore fishery when they're a little bit older. Um, so it's, it's possible that you know, we see this wild recruitment, but they actually don't show up in the fishery until they're a little bit older. Um, I want to emphasize here that population is not rehabilitated, but certainly this is a positive trend uh, in terms of progress. And actually, these numbers uh, throughout Lake Michigan are up about 3 to 19% um, from last year, depending on their management unit. Another thing we were interested in looking at, um, we got a lot of feedback from groups just like this. Uh, why, you know, we're stocking all these lake trout offshore, where anglers fish near shore. Why are we putting fish where anglers can't catch them? And we were interested in looking at um, you know, what's the contribution of those lake trout that are stocked offshore to the near shore fishery. And what we're looking at here in this map, uh, sorry, in this figure, this is the, uh, the number of fish caught um, per 100,000 fish stock. And each of these blue bars uh, is an offshore stocking location. These red bars are the near shore stocking locations. And so what we're seeing here, um, this is correcting for number of fish stock, is that on, on a lake-wide basis, um, Julian's Reef and the Southern Refuge, or the Mid Lake Reef Complex, have a really high return rate to the nearshore fishery. And it's actually much higher on average than fish that are stocked nearshore. Um, here in Michigan, the differences are a lot smaller, but still um, the highest contributor in terms of the return rate is the, is the Southern Refuge. So to our surprise, we were actually learning that these lake trout that are stocked offshore are the ones that are typically being caught by anglers nearshore. Um, and in fact, if you, uh, if you not correct for number of fish stock, and just look at the percentage of, of an average angler's creel. Uh, lake wide, about 62% of stocked lake trout in angler's creel are actually coming from offshore stocking locations. So um, what may be happening here, if you think about it, these, these fish that are offshore, um, you know, they're stocked in an area that has a minimal exploitation rate for the early stage of their lives, and by design they're being stocked in areas that are supposed to be great trout habitat. So if they're surviving at a higher rate than those nearshore stocked fish, even though some of them will stay offshore their whole lives, those that do move nearshore appear to be providing a higher number to the fishery than those that are stocked in the nearshore area. So a positive trajectory for lake trout wild recruitment um, and lake trout stocked offshore do contribute the most to the nearshore recreational catch. And then uh, I'm going to conclude today with some information on salmon and trout diets. Um, most of what you'll see is uh, from a collaboration with uh, Purdue, University of Illinois, um, SUNY at Brockport, and uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, uh, looking at diets from 2015 and 2016 in Lake Michigan. And uh, as Chuck Medenjian mentioned earlier, um, you know, we see these changes in the forage base. Uh, alewife have been trending downward, brown gobies have been trending upward, uh, and a number of other changes. So, uh, as you might imagine, understanding how the diet and the potential for competition among the salmon and trout species um, is, is a pretty critical uh, question to be asking in the lake at this point. And so, um, to jump right in it here, this is a figure showing um, diet data from stomach contents. These are lake-wide summaries, uh, and this is the percent of diet by weight. And in, in all these figures today, you're going to see kind of the same color codes. So we have the percentage here on the, on the, on the y-axis with our five different species on the x. Um, right away, you see these blue bars are the, the largest bar in pretty much every species. Those are the alewife. Everybody's eating alewife. Um, but we do see some differences among the species. So the Chinook salmon and uh, uh, also the coho salmon are the ones that have the highest reliance on alewife uh, in terms of their percent diet. Um, species like brown trout and lake trout have a more diverse diet, in particular because of this orange bar. Those are gobies that we're seeing in, in their diet. And then the steelhead, this big green bar of the terrestrial invertebrates, everybody sees kind of exploding out of their stomachs, especially in the springtime. Um, in 2016, we kind of see the same pattern with some other items popping up. And this, this shows that there actually is some, some variance, uh, variability from year to year, which is part of the importance of continuing this study with the, the Roth et al. work that, that Dan O'Keefe mentioned at the beginning. Um, so in terms of similarities, this these blue bars, those are alewife, those are still the majority for each species. We still see a lot of gobies for brown trout and lake trout. Um, still see invertebrates here for steelhead. Uh, we see more yellow perch, those are these yellow bars, and more bloater from 2016, those are the black bars. Um, and then these, these pink bars are actually spiny water flea. Um, now the, the, the percent of the diet may be pretty high for spiny water flea, but the animals aren't actually eating a ton of water flea. The way these are, percentages are calculated is it looks at the, uh, the average in a given time period, and if over that time period the animals didn't consume any prey fish, their stomachs were pretty much empty, you get a high percentage of these water fleas. So that was kind of our first lesson from the diet, is that most energy from fish prey 
are from fish prey, even if invertebrates are abundant. We can do this by comparing the percent of diet with what's called the ration. That is basically just the total mass consumed from each diet. So here's our 2016 percent plot again. You see our invertebrates, Bithotrephes, I'm sorry, the, the spiny water flea, and the terrestrial invertebrates here in green. If we look at this as a ration plot, and this is the mass consumed, those bars pretty much disappear. Yeah, we, we still see some invertebrates, but the spiny water fleas are almost non-existent. And this gives us a more clear picture that yes, it's fish that are really important. Um, 2016, a lot of gobies for brown trout, some gobies for coho, uh, moderate amount of gobies for, for lake trout, mostly yellow up here for Chinook salmon. Um, the second thing we learned was that there's a lot of seasonal variability in diet. So there were more gobies in the early part of the year um, and terrestrial invertebrates in the early part of the year, more bloaters late, alewives all the time. Um, so to just highlight this, I'm just going to show you one example. What you're seeing here, this is the proportion of diet by weight comprised by round goby. Uh, the green bars are lake trout and the gray bars are burbot. And what we see here is in the springtime, there's a high amount of goby in the diet for these animals. And the same again in fall, but not so much in the summer. And what I think is happening here is uh, this is relating to the annual migration that round gobies do. In, in the fall, round gobies migrate out to deeper water. It's a little bit warmer there in the wintertime. In the spring, they migrate back. In the summer, they're in shallow, rocky water, um, typically under rocks so that they can spawn. So they're not very accessible to predators here in the summertime. But when they're moving through these, these deeper areas, they are more accessible. And we see that uptick in the diets of the lake trout and the burbot at that time. Um, we also see a lot of spatial variability. So what you see here in South Haven is not necessarily what an angler in Surgeon Bay is going to see in the diet of their fish. So um, two quick examples. One is Chinook salmon. And I wanted to highlight Chinook salmon because uh, by and large this is the most consistent diet you can get. They feed almost exclusively on alewife. But in 2016 in northeastern Lake Michigan, so that's the area around Frankfurt, almost half their diet was comprised of, of, of bloater chubs. Uh, it's, it's the only time we've seen that high of a composition of anything that was an alewife for Chinook. And it kind of highlights the spatial variability. Uh, we see that spatial variability in lake trout as well. So this is from a, a publication that came out in 2017 for lake trout diets. Um, here on, these green bars are, are rainbow smelt. If you look at Lake Michigan, the red bars uh, in these pies are alewife. A lot of alewife on the western shore. These blue bars are gobies. A lot more here in the southern part of Lake Michigan. So a lot of spatial variability in diets as well. And then finally, there's the potential for depth variability. So um, here is a figure provided from George Jonas from Michigan DNR um, from two areas of Michigan. And uh, basically, yellow is alewife, red is goby. And you're looking at the time series plot from 96 to 2016. Um, so what I'm trying to get at here, these are from bottom set gill nets. And so the, the percentage of the diet, the lake trout here for gobies is you know, 70 80%, which is way higher than what we see in our angler diets. And there's a seasonal component here, too. These are April through uh, June, and, and our diets typically are, are May through July, even in the early period. But there's likely some, something going on here where if you're catching a fish on the bottom, it's probably eating bottom-oriented prey like gobies. If you're catching them while you're out trolling, it's probably orienting to open water prey like yellowhead. So um, the bottom line is that diet depends on where, when, and how a fish is caught. And uh, so how can we determine how much of each prey type is eaten over the long term? Well, there's a technique that we've used, um, stable isotope analysis, um, that provides kind of a longer term indication of diet. These, these isotopes reflect diet over the past uh, you know, four to six months, whereas the stomach contents the last couple of days. And to kind of orient you to here to what we see in an isotope plot, these are um, our salmon community in, in the colored dots here. Um, this x-axis is providing offshore to nearshore, and this, this y-axis is showing both trophic level and depth. And so to highlight some examples, we have um, round gobies in the nearshore versus uh, sculpins and alewife offshore. Um, in terms of our differences in the food chain, the, the higher you go here, the higher you are in the food chain. Here's our zooplankton and our mussels. Here are our planktivores, the alewife and smelt. And here are the things that are eating those alewife and smelt. You can see that clear increase in, in the food chain. We also see this depth effect. So the sculpin species actually were higher in this, uh, this nitrogen component than even a lot of the salmon. And it's not that sculpin are eating salmon. It's that there's actually this microbial process in the lake that results in this enrichment out deep. So um, how, how are Lake Michigan salmon and trout adjusting to this forage base? Well, one of the things we see is that the difference between a lake trout on average and the rest of the community is about the same difference between that community and large alewife, which is a pretty substantial difference. And it supports this idea that, that lake trout have a, a more diverse diet. So um, 
to kind of highlight this, there's a, a technique where we use to look at the overlap of uh, uh, facial overlap. It's basically a way of looking at competition between these animals. And uh, if we look at uh, this value here, this is the overlap between lake trout and Chinook salmon. Uh, we can look at this through ellipses. So basically, in, in this plot, which looks a little complicated at first, um, all of our salmon and trout species are in these, these colored ovals. And in this case, that difference between levels of the food chain has been corrected for. So uh, if you see an oval overlapping with a prey item, it means that that's a component of the diet. This 41% overlap is this yellow area here. This green circle here are the lake trout, and then this orangey circle in here are the genetic salmon. And of course, that overlap is occurring right where yellow life occur. Um, the rest of this lake trout orb is kind of encircling bloater, rainbow smelt, and round goby, and that's where that diversification shows and showing that difference here in, in the diet as indicated by the isotopes. So um, what do we take from all this? Any given stomach does not indicate the species.